Well, welcome, those of you who have already joined. Um, we're going to wait a minute or so, um, so that some more people, as they're trying to connect to, this, to the webinar, and we'll get started in just a second. All right. Well, welcome, everybody. Um, thank you for joining us today for our webinar. Uh, my name is Alexandra Vandenberg, and I am the Associate Director for the Michael and Susan Dell Center for Healthy Living, and I'm also Professor of Health Promotion and Behavioral Sciences at the UT Health Houston School of Public Health in Austin. So today's webinar is hosted by the Michael and Susan Dell Center for Healthy Living, and our vision is healthy children in a healthy world um, with a mission to advance health and healthy living for children and families through early and impactful interventions. And next slide, please. So we just want to, I just want to start by saying thank you for the Michael and Susan Dell Foundation for funding um, the center and then also for funding this um, specific webinar. Next slide, please. Um, just um, here's a slide that just has some information and different resources um, related to our center. And so you can um, check out the QR codes on your screen to access all these resources. Next slide, please. Then our center also leads the Texas RPC or Research to Policy Collaboration project which creates um, the legislative related resources described on this slide. Again, you can scan the QR codes and you can learn more about the project and also the many resources that we have um, online. And I just also want to say that all the slides and the webinar um, will be archived on our website. And if you have any questions during the presentation, please enter those questions in the chat box. Um, we will have some time at the very end to answer some of your questions. And so now I am very um, honored and excited to introduce um, my colleague and also friend, uh, Dr. Jamie Davis. Um, Dr. Davis is a registered dietitian and a professor in the Department of Nutritional Sciences at the University of Texas in Austin. She also serves as the director of EDEN, which stands for Education, Evaluation and Nutrition Lab, which supports research and training for schools and community-based gardens in making them accessible and read readily available for all children. Um, so again, um, I'm honored to um, just have Dr. Davis present on her, um, on her presentation called Impact of School Nutrition and Gardening Programs on Health and Academic Outcomes. Jamie is all yours. Awesome. Well, thank you and good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm really excited to share with you kind of um, my journey over the past uh, decade and all the work that we've done with school garden programs. And so I'm gonna give you highlight of some of our um, RCTs and kind of more evidence-based stuff. And then I'm gonna go into how we're working with schools and communities to sustain some of these programs. So there's a little background for many people on this call probably um, have a, a little bit of understanding of, of how gardening can improve health. But really for the past uh, three decades, we've seen a lot of research on, on how gardening can improve health. We've seen um, that it increases a child's willingness to taste vegetables. If they grow the food, they know where it comes from, so they are willing to try it. And then it also increases the preference for those fruits and vegetables. We've seen that increases the identification of fruits and vegetables, their attitudes towards fruits and vegetables, increase up efficacy to eat fruits and vegetables, and improves dietary knowledge. And in along with that, we see increases in cooking and gardening knowledge. Um, there's been some studies that have shown increased physical fitness and physical activity in response to gardening programs. There's been a few studies that have shown increased student engagement and a few studies that have also shown increased science scores. And then a bunch of um, studies uh, that have shown that gardening programs can result in significant increases in consumption of fruits and vegetables. 
However, the research and up until, you know, about six or seven years didn't really have a whole lot of randomized control trials. Um, There's some that was done by uh, the UT School of Public Health that I'm not gonna get into, um, but we do know that uh, looking at the effects of health beyond dietary intake, there wasn't there was a little bit of a, a sparsity in our in our literature on this. And at the time, I was actually in this is about ten years ago. I was in uh, I was a professor or assistant professor in the um, uh, in the Keck School of Medicine at the University of Southern California. And just to give you a little bit of background on my research, I had done a lot of kind of clinical nutrition interventions, and in doing so, we designed, you know, we had lots of R01s, and those are like the big um, NIH grants and millions of dollars of funding to develop different types of nutrition clinical interventions. And while I was doing this, um, I had a colleague, that a friend of mine that actually had a community garden in LA, and she's like, hey, I know you design nutrition interventions, and I know you're also a gardener. Would you be interested in kind of partnering with me? And so we did a small study with uh, Kaiser, and literally when I say small, I think we had $6,000 to do a non-randomized control trial. And we developed the curriculum and uh, pilot tested it. It was it was effective, and we were able to use that funding or that preliminary data to apply for an NIH R21 grant. And if you're not familiar with NIH mechanisms, this is a smaller kind of innovative grant that is designed if you don't have a lot of pilot data to scale different types of interventions. And so we decided to do a, we conducted an RCT, a randomized control trial with four elementary schools and they were randomized um, uh, by region. And so two intervention schools, approximately 200 third through fifth graders and two control schools with delayed intervention. And it was a 12 week after school nutrition and gardening and cooking curriculum. And we used that same curriculum that my colleague and I from UCLA developed. And we also led bi-monthly, twice a month uh, parental workshops and we built the gardens at the schools. Um, and in addition to like looking at dietary measures, we added um, a fasting blood draw to assess glucose, insulin and lipids. And we also looked at blood pressure and anthropometrics. So here you can see, um, and these are in inner city schools in, in LA, and so there's not as much green space. So most of the courtyards and the, the playgrounds were fenced in, and so we built these above ground. Um, and they really helped to, to beautify the schools. And so this is just one of our schools, and we would, every lesson, we would um, cook with the kids outside. And basically the conclusions from this study, it was the first randomized control uh, garden-based trial to show redu results, reductions in obesity, uh, waist circumference, and we also saw a reduction in metabolic syndrome. Metabolic syndrome is a clustering of different metabolic risk factors that includes um, uh, blood glucose from the uh, and lipids from the, the blood sample. We also saw increased dietary fiber, vegetables, and whole grain intake. And then similar to what research has also shown, we show improved self-efficacy to eat fruits and vegetables, nutrition and gardening knowledge improved, motivation to cook and garden, and we also saw that kids started to garden at home. So again, this was a very small RCT, and we used this funding to get a much larger grant from NIH that was funded in 2015. And so I'm gonna tell you about Texas Sprouts, and I'm gonna call it Texas Sprouts 1.0 because we're hoping um, to expand this moving forward. And we, um, I'll give you information about that in a second. So Texas Sprouts is, was a one-year um, in-school gardening program. So like before we did an after-school program, this was taught in school and it's to test the effects of a one-year in-school gardening, nutrition and cooking program on improving diet and reducing obesity measures in high-risk third through fifth grade graders and their families. It was funded, the primary grant was from the NIH, but it was in partnership with UT Health. Um, Sandra, uh, Dr. Evans on this call, she was um, one of my co-investigators co on this study. Um, also, we worked with A&M and AgriLife Extension. We worked with Seton Medical Center, and then we had additional funding from some uh, nonprofit Sprouts Healthy Communities Foundation and Whole Kids Foundation provided some, some extra support for this study. A little bit about the methodology, and you can read about it in the article below. It's been published in the journal ISPNPAL in 2020, our methodology paper. 
but it was 16 schools that were randomized either to Texas sprouts or to control. And it was, um, we led it over three waves from 2016 to 2019. But each, um, each wave consisted of a different batch of schools. So every school just got a one school year program. We built an edible garden at each site and the gardens we're only about $5,000 per site. And you can see this is an example of what the gardens look like. We designed the gardens that they had teaching beds. Many times they were um, done with cinder blocks and the art teacher would take them and the kids would decorate them. And then we'd have a big work day with the school. And on average, there were 150 to 200 families that would come and help us build these school gardens. They were anywhere from 0.25 to a half acre. We tried to situate them so that they were in a full sun area with easy access to the school. Um, so we didn't want to put them way off to the side where they were out of sight, out of mind. They really were, we really tried to get the schools to put them in the center of the playgrounds and their outdoor side. So that it was constantly, um, uh, you know, um, visible to the families and the, and the kids at school. We taught a series of 18 garden nutrition lessons, and um, we talked a lot about this when we first started on what was the best approach? Was it to train the teachers on how to do this, or was it to provide the educators to be able to do this? We, did, we ended up doing the latter, where we provided educators that were trained, and most of them were um, you know, previous school teachers, science teachers, and we trained them on our lessons, and they would go into the schools bring the material and supplies and do these lessons with the kids. Every lesson had a at least a taste test, but most, I think nine out of the 12, sorry, yeah, nine, no, 16 out of the 18 had a full cooking lesson. And so they were an hour long and the cooking lessons typically lasted about 30 minutes of that. So cooking was a big part of that. We provided, um, there were sheds at each of the sites and we provided cooking supplies and materials. And then the other thing about the gardens is each of them had an outdoor space where we had a whiteboard and we provided benches or tree stumps. And then the families, we also taught nine parent family classes that were um, taught in the um, every month. And we worked with the schools. Each school was different on what time of day they wanted it. Some wanted in the morning, some wanted after school, some even wanted on the weekends. We went to a lot of effort to try to make sure we taught the classes when the families were available. And I'll tell you that data, they didn't end up coming as much as we had hoped. So the measures included um, that we took were, uh, we did in-person child measures. We did anthropometrics, which included height, weight, BMI, blood pressure, waist circumference. We brought a Tanita body fat um, scale and they we measured body fat percentage, including lean body mass and percent body fat. While we were doing the measures uh, behind um, partitions, the kids were off, were sitting and filling out their survey packets. Um, and the survey packets included dietary intake, we used the SPAN questionnaire, um, and related behaviors. We also did a subsample of 24-hour diet recalls on the kids. I'll show you the data later. It was about a quarter of the kids that we were able to, to get two recalls, one week and one weekday, at the beginning of the year and at the end of the year. We did a blood draw and we used this as a diabetes screen. And again, this was a subsample. It was an optional blood draw. And so we didn't want kids not to be able to, to be a part of the measures if they didn't want to do the blood draw. And many of you guys are probably figuring out, how did we get so many kids to do the blood draw? Well, we paid them. We paid them $20 every time. And only if they did the pre-blood draw were they eligible to do the post-blood draw. And then the parents, we gave the free diabetes screen test uh, results back to them. So many of these kids had never been tested and so the parents actually were really um, wanting the kids to do the blood draw so they could get the diabetes results. And then we had parents fill out um, evaluation measures. They filled out a questionnaire packet that was sent home and that questionnaire packet included um, information about dietary intake, home environment, and also diet related behaviors. Here's a little video that was made. Our research was actually highlighted um, as a game changer in Texas um, at UT. And probably one of my biggest claims to fame is this video was shown on the Jumbotron at one of the UT home games. Um, I think my kids don't know much about what I do. The only thing I think they know is the fact that mom was on the Jumbotron at a UT game and that they thought was really cool. So here you go. <laughs> 
Texan Sprouts will follow 2,400 third through fifth graders at 16 Austin area schools over the course of two years. Its purpose is simple. Examine the effects a gardening, nutrition, and cooking program has on student health, both in and outside the classroom. We do talk about all the nutritional aspects and benefits of the, of the fruit and vegetables, but we really just try to get them to like to eat it. Texas Sprouts, educating children from seed to plate about nutrition and its potential life-changing benefits. We hope that the data that we get from the study actually shows that the garden-based program does have big reductions in obesity, um, improvements in diet, but we're also looking at other things in this grant like academic performance and time on task, so that's like how behavior changes in the classroom. Every single lesson has either a cooking component or a tape test, so they will be trying something at every lesson. And we don't cook it for them, we have the kids actually cook it. We set up tables and they're preparing, they're cutting. I think it's particularly important that students are able to just see their food grow, that they're able to come out in the backyard of their school and watch food that they planted grow into something that they can eat. I mean, I think there's a lot of misinformation about diets and what you should eat and what you shouldn't eat out there. And especially small kids are, are super malleable and they aren't really sure what to decide. And this is just an awesome opportunity for us to say, hey, there's nothing truer than taking something out of the ground and eating it and it tasting good. Yeah. Cilantro. Can you all say that? Cilantro. 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 Oh, muy bien. Tu pronunciación. Kids these days don't know where their food comes from. You hold up different vegetables and you have no idea what they are. And so teaching kids where our food comes from and the food system that is involved in getting food from the farm to the grocery store is really key. <laughs> Next slide. Um, one thing nice about working with garden-based roosters is you always get the prettiest pictures and kids out in the garden playing and eating and I love it. Um, so uh, baseline data, we it was 16 schools and 42, 39 eligible subjects, students um, uh, from these 16 schools. And we were able to get 78% of them consented to be in the study. And um, I'm happy to talk about how we got such great um, uh, participation. And remember, all the kids got the program. These were the kids that were actually a part of the evaluation piece. 95% or 3135 children completed all the baseline and clinical survey measures. Again, we didn't, we were in the schools, uh, we, we went in with teams and we were able to collect this data. We would collect data over a course of a week um, or a couple days at each school. And so if we missed kids, we would try to come back on Friday to get a makeup day. So we got really good uh, compliance and really good, um, you know, pretty much our entire sample was able to fill out these baseline data. Um, 92 percent of parents completed baseline survey. We were shocked. Um, we did pay the, the um, uh, parents got a $15 grocery gift card for filling out the survey, but we got 2,800. I will tell you this blew our budget because we anticipated 50% participation. So we were short on funds for that, which is good why we had a lot of foundation funds that helped support this grant to cover the offsets of the so many people, so many parents filling out the surveys. We had 35% that completed the optional blood draw. So that's over, you know, over 1,100 kids that did that blood draw. And then 24% of children completed the optional baseline diet recalls. So some descriptives, 31, 35 completed the clinical measures, 47% were female, 65% were Hispanic, and that was by design. Out of the 16, um, part of the, to be in the, uh, the schools, for the schools to be eligible, they had to be a majority serving Hispanic populations and a majority free and reduced lunch. So we met those, those criteria, 65% were Hispanic. The average age was nine, uh, close to 70% 70, 70 were receiving free and reduced lunch, close to 70% reported food insecurity. And what was shocking, because we had not, there really hadn't been an, a, a sample, this large of a sample of of healthy children with the blood draw at this young of age, between seven and 10, 
we were shocked to see that 26% had pre-diabetic values either from an HbA1c or from the glucose value. So that was a lot higher. We, we've seen those type of data in teenagers and we've seen those type of data in children with overweight or obesity, but in a normal population of elementary kids, that was a lot higher than we anticipated. So the follow-up data at the end, we also got pretty good um, follow-up data. We 91% or 28, uh, over 2,800 completed the post-clinical and survey measures. 45% of parents completed the post-survey. So that was closer to what we thought at pre, still 1305 completed those. 62% completed the post-optional blood draw. So close to 700 kids with baseline and post uh, blood draws. And then 64% of children completed the post-optional post, optional post uh, sorry, diet recalls, which is close to 500. So for the results, and this, um, these, th these results are published in the Journal of Eastman Paul 2020. And uh, we found that the intervention as designed had an increase in vegetable servings whereas the control stayed the same. So it's always good when you design your intervention like this and your main outcome, in fact, comes out to be um, significant. When we looked at the end, sorry, that was data using the screener data. So that was data using the full 2800 that completed the post. Uh, changes in healthy eating index. So when looking at the diet recalls, we didn't see an overall effect of diet quality um, using the HEI index, but we did see several inter, uh, component scores improved. And this work was done by my previous grad student, Matthew Landry, who's now at UC Irvine as faculty. The intervention compared to the control resulted in an increase in vegetable score, an increase in total dairy, a decrease in fatty acids, and a decrease in refined grains. When looking at the blood data, we saw similar improvement, or we saw um, positive improvements. We saw uh, HbA1c went down in the intervention group and went up in the control. And for those of y'all that aren't aware, HbA1c is a marker of long-term glucose control. It reflects glucose control over the past three months. We also saw LDL cholesterol went significantly down in the intervention. It also went down in the control, but not as much. And you can read about that paper in JAMA Open Network in 2022. When looking at academic performance, this is using the Texas STAR test scores. Those are Texas's standardized test scores. So looking overall, total scores actually went up in the um, intervention and also went up in the control, but went up more in the intervention. And this was primarily draw, um, driven by uh, the fourth grade reading scores. And so we didn't actually see a difference in math and science. And all of our, all of our lessons were mapped on many of the Texas STAR standards for um, math, science, um, language arts, and health. Uh, and But the reading is what improved, and we went back and we kind of dug, did some digging. In addition to getting the, the lessons in the garden about every other week throughout the school year, they did have journals, and the teachers, when we weren't there, were taking their kids out to the garden to, to do journaling. And so we think that that was maybe part of the reason is that they were journaling it. And then one thing that uh, anyone that does interventions on here knows that when you when you scale interventions, probably in nutrition interventions, the hardest component to retain is usually the cooking piece, mainly because it's expensive, it's time consuming. And when we set out, as I mentioned, 16 of our 18 lessons had pretty full, I I intense um, cooking lessons. Um, I remember I got a lot of pushback from my staff. They kept wanting to it's too much, it's too much, we need, to, we need to cover the content. And we really were intentional in making sure we kept retained those cooking pieces. And sometimes, like I mentioned before, it was half of the lesson was cooking and having the kids go to the garden, plant things, but also harvest the plant and then come over, wash it and prepare it. And so I really wanted to know, because our sample was so large, which components of our intervention were having the biggest effect on um, the, the changes in vegetable intake? And, and that was done by my um, previous grad student, Dr. Sarvanaz uh, Vandi Safi, who is now a postdoc at NYU. She basically showed that it was mediated by cooking self-efficacy, gardening attitudes, gardening self-efficacy, nutrition and gardening knowledge and fruit and vegetable preference mediated that, in, that increase. Some of the strongest effects were in fact, 
with cooking self-efficacy. So I think that this is one of the first studies to show that cook, retaining the cooking and the gardening pieces was critical to seeing the increases in vegetable intake. Another way of looking at diet intake, and this work was done by my previous grad student, Dr. Matthew Jeans, who's now a data analyst at iStation, um, is to look at uh, ultra-processed foods using the NOVA food classification system. So those of y'all that aren't familiar with it, it's, it's a way of coding your data so that you can look at the degree of processing. And so there's, there's four different categories, but the ones that we're the most interested in are the category one, which is the unprocessed or minimally processed foods. Those are basically, think of those as whole foods with nothing done to them, versus the ultra processed foods, which are any, you know, uh, baked items, anything that comes in a package. Um, and then you have also processed culinary ingredients and processed foods. But for this, we're really interested in kind of the ultra processed foods or the whole foods. And so using the recall data, we were able to classify our data using these, these processing um, categories. And what we showed is that the intervention versus control, we saw an increase in unprocessed foods in the intervention and a decrease in the control. And then in, um, this, the reverse was true for ultra-processed foods. So we saw a significant increase in ultra-processed foods in the control, whereas we saw a significant decrease in ultra-processed foods in the intervention. And so, you know, this is a fairly, it's been around for, you know, uh, almost a decade, this classification, but now more and more studies are, are utilizing it. And it does, the, the caveat is it's most time to look at ultra-processed foods, you have to have recall data. So this is using the subsample. So to kind of um, recap our findings to date, school gardening programs, um, Texas sprouts compared to control resulted in an increased vegetable intake, improved diet quality, reduced ultra processed foods and increased minimally processed foods, improved glucose control, reductions in lipids, improved academic performance, and a whole slew of uh, dietary psychosocial behaviors, such as cooking and gardening self-efficacy and attitudes. And those, those things mediated the changes in vegetable intake. So that was kind of the recap of Texas Sprouts, but Texas Sprouts has really launched my, my Eden Lab into doing a variety of work. So I wanted to spend some time telling you about some of the sustainability projects we're doing. So when we first started out and wanted to do this, even in getting our schools that were eligible, it became very apparent that we didn't really have a good understanding of what was going on in the school garden lands landscape around Central Texas. For example, when we, we didn't even know what schools had gardens. And when we started to investigate, it was like we didn't, we didn't even know. Sustainable Food Center was working with us initially and they were on this grant and they used to provide a bunch of school garden uh, webinars, which was great. Um, for um, the, the, the Central Texas area. Um, however, they didn't really evaluate those school garden trainings that they provided. And so when we went to them to ask what, what list, is there a list of schools that had gardens, it was, it was, it was a little piecemeal. Um, for example, a school might've gotten a training three years ago, but they had no idea the status of that garden. And so to be in Texas Sprouts, we initially wanted schools that had no garden, no exposure to gardening, and to have a fresh start. So even finding those schools that had no gardening, and when I say a school garden, I mean sometimes it, it was a, um, uh, a one or two containers or garden boxes that had weeds in it, and maybe had been um, a teacher had been interested in, or one or two teachers had taken advantage of it. So we allowed some of those schools, but we didn't want a school to come into our program that already had a thriving garden. So it became very apparent that we really needed to first do a, a large scale assessment of school gardens in Texas, as well as it's expanded across the nation. So we worked with Ann Mueller, who's no longer at ASD, but we worked with, she was the outdoor learning specialist. Um, and we also worked with Edwin Marty, director of sustainability at City Austin. And we wanted to identify the barriers and strategies used to sustain and maintain school garden programs. We adapted a survey um, uh, from Dr. Birch. She had a green tool that she used in New York. Um, she's a colleague of mine. And um, we adapted her survey and we were interested in similar domains. So there are four domains in the survey that we expanded, looking at resources and support, physical gardens, student experience, and school community. 
And because we were actively working in the, the Austin area, we were able to actually ask experts that worked with these schools to rank whether or not these schools were thriving or struggling. And so data was collected um, on school gardens across the garden, uh, greater Austin using this survey. We had 523 school teachers that filled the survey out and we had a slightly different survey that was geared towards school administrators. We had 174 school administrators fill out the survey and it was all done on Qualtrics, so it was all done electronically. So we captured this on over 109 schools from eight different ISDs across greater Austin area. And the kind of little bit of the demographic, 63% of those schools, uh, sorry, the average eligibility for free and reduced lunch was 63%. So most of these schools that we surveyed were in fact Title I schools. And the, aver um, the majority actually served Hispanic communities and the majority were also elementary schools. Um, when our panel of experts identified the schools, out of there were 23% that were identified as having a thriving garden. These are schools that were doing very well in all the domains. And so when we looked at which factors, which survey questions kind of predicted having a thriving garden, um, we found that having funding, so any kind of funding to support your school garden program was linked to a threefold increase in having a thriving garden having a community partner. So working with a nonprofit or a group that's, that specializes in, in school garden was linked to a threefold increase in having a thriving garden. Having teacher training, so some resources for teachers to be able to teach in the school garden was linked to a five-fold increase. Having a garden leadership committee, and I'm gonna circle back to this, but having a group of teachers or parents or a committee at the school that would help take care of the physical maintenance um, and promote the school garden culture was linked to a five-fold increase. Having a garden curriculum that was adopted by the school district was linked to a five-fold increase. And the biggest single predictor of having a thriving garden was in fact having adequate administrator support was linked to a 12-fold increase. So this is the first type of study in its kind to really look at what are the barriers that are predicting whether or not school gardens can thrive. And so we have since worked with the School Garden Support Organization Network or the SGSO Network. If you haven't checked out, please go to their site. They have some really useful resources. And they helped to work with us to expand and modify our survey so that it would be more appropriate and useful across the nation. And so we expanded that survey, right? It's currently 65 items. It takes about 15 minutes. It goes pretty. It goes pretty fast. 15 to 20 minutes is what it's taking our school teachers to complete. This is to, um, we're focusing on the school teacher one for now, uh, and we worked with SGSO as well as the Sprouts Healthy Communities Foundation helps support this funding. But they are supporting. Um, we've been able to release a scorecard so that schools can take the survey and immediately get back the results on where they need help and then it guides them to different types of resources. And we have availability on my website as well as on the SGSO network. Um, they have links to this. Um, since then, we have disseminated the survey nationwide and it's been completed by a, a little over 500. Um, and what's shocking is we were able to get teachers from 48 states to fill this out. And uh, we presented this, this work at a large school garden summit that was sponsored by Sprouts Healthy Communities Foundation last year. Um, here's an example of what the scorecard looks like. So once you fill out the scorecard, it kind of takes you to the different domains on where you're maybe thriving and where you need help. And it's just generic text here, but if, it, if, you, if for example, your student experience is lacking, um, then we give suggestions and links that go below that scorecard to um, point those school stakeholders to where they could get help. Like if it's curriculum, if it's they need access to volunteers for their work days. Um, and again, this is kind of the resources are constantly being updated, um, but the scorecard is really to give metrics back to the schools, at, at the school teacher themselves. And then they can go to their principal and say, hey, we took the scorecard, we're doing well in this area, but we really need funding or help or support in this area. 
And looking at that data from 500 teachers, um, we are actually one of my students, Jennifer Morris, one of my graduate students is going to be writing up those results now. And we now have longitudinal data. So we're going to look at changes across time. That's going to be part of our dissertation. But just looking at some of the initial barriers that teachers are saying why it's difficult to sustain their school gardens. The biggest one is time constraints, um, followed by teacher involvement and interest. Um, and then you can see some of the other barriers, lack of help assistance with garden, lack of physical resources, and those things called like compost and seeds, uh, lack of knowledge and training, um, lack of a garden coordinator to help communicate, um, and then so forth, so on. The biggest contributors to success, if you flip it and you kind of looked at a slightly different way of um, uh, looking at the data, we were really pleased to see that the, the biggest contributor was having a garden coordinator um, and then followed by having teachers and students actually use uh, the garden and then also maintenance of the physical garden, um, having the ability to maintain it and having volunteers come was also a huge, a huge contributor to success. So that brings us to our next programming is that in doing this, we realized after Texas Sprouts, we're like, we have a really cool evidence-based project, but we're still struggling with how can we help train teachers in this area? At this time, Sustainable Food Center actually kind of shifted their mission and their, um, their priorities. And so they were no longer offering school garden support trainings. And so it left this kind of big hole in our city and in central Texas, where there wasn't a lot of support for schools that had gardens that wanted training and wanted to continue. So we launched the Sprouting Teachers Program, and this is funded by Sprouts Healthy Communities Foundation, and they have funded us since 2008, and we just crossed the $1 million in funding from them. Um, uh, so we are happy to say that, that actually we crossed that last week. Um, and what we've done so far is we provide garden-based trainings to over 370 teachers. We provide each teacher or group of uh, teachers with six sessions. They get two virtual and four in person. And we've adapted the current curriculum to teach in the garden. So it's not like we came in and said, you need to use our, our Texas Sprouts curriculum. Instead, we said, what curriculum are you using and how can we help you teach it in the garden setting? And this work is uh, could not be done without my, my amazing team that works on this and the trainings, as well as Lindsay Wall, who is the executive director of the, uh, director of the Sprouts Foundation. Um, and then we also do training to garden leadership committees. And we've so far done 62, we've formed 62 garden leadership committees at schools, and we offer them six sessions, two virtual, four in person. And we really focus on the maintenance and sustainability of physical garden. Because if you have somebody that's taking care of your garden at your school, then other teachers who want to use their garden, they can work, they can really concentrate on utilizing the garden and teaching in the garden as opposed to trying to maintain it in physical, make sure it looks, the upkeep is there. Current reach, we've reached over 50 schools across 28 school districts across nine states with this program. Obviously the, the out-of-state ones, all that training is virtual, whereas the in-state and around within 60 miles of, of UT Austin will do the in-person. Um, so far we've reached 10,000 children by this programming. And right now with funding from Big Green, uh, we are piloting providing $2,000 stipends to two to three teachers that are serving on the GLC. Uh, we had pilot data that I showed you that suggests that providing some funding to the teachers, just like you would provide funding to a robotics teacher, you're providing them a little extra incentive to, to be the garden lead at their schools. And uh, we're also pilot providing cook kits to classrooms. Again, this is working with the Sprouts Healthy Communities Foundation and the Sprouts Mar Farmers Market Grocery Stores. They have actually um, put a classroom site cook kit on their, on their website so that teachers can go directly to the website and order a cook kit that's then Instacarted to their school. And we're providing um, uh, some support to help those teachers then teach in the schools. And uh, with more funding from Sprouts Healthy Communities Foundations, they are giving us money to evaluate this. And so next year, we're going to evaluate teacher outcomes, uh, which we've already evaluated, but we're also going to evaluate administrative outcomes. We're going to be looking at child outcomes. So how does this program impact dietary intake, food and nutrition security, social emotional learning, STEM and eco-literacy outcomes? We're also going to be doing some evaluation on the parents um, of participating uh, schools. 
And this brings us to the Eden Nutrition interns. So while we did Texas Sprouts, we essentially had over 350 undergrad UT students that volunteered on this project. When I say volunteered, each of them, the average gave about 100 hours over the course of two semesters. And so after the grant ended, we realized that there was this kind of hole in our um, curriculum at the undergraduate level. And there was also this desire and want from the students to have more experiential learning. So we worked within our department and created a two semester course. Uh, it's an elective for all nutrition majors. And we currently have around 500 undergraduate nutrition majors. So we're a large department. And this um, with my awesome colleague, Michelle Hawke Cooper, she and I developed this course and she now has taken it over and has done amazing things with it. Um, but basically these, these are two semester course, the UT students, they work in pairs and they're placed with elementary teachers. The elementary teachers fill out application to become preceptors. And so last year we had quite a few applications. Teachers want to become preceptors because then we place nutrition students with them and the nutrition students teach a series of nine outdoor lessons. So they go to the schools, they bring gardening, nutrition and cooking um, supplies and they teach gardening, nutrition and cooking lessons with the classrooms while the preceptors help them and evaluate them. So you can see the breakdown, but in total, we've done this in 15 schools, 133 UT interns, 51 preceptors, and we've reached over 1,200 elementary students. And right now we've evaluated the effects on the nutrition students, and we've seen significant increases in the following domains. So we've seen that food and nutrition knowledge has gone up, communication, marketing, cultural sensitivity, advocacy, education, policy systems and environmental change, their ability to do research and evaluation, management and leadership, all of these things. They were, it wasn't a randomized control trial, but we do see significant improvements in all of these domains. So just to give you a little kind of uh, um, flavor of what we're cooking up moving forward, uh, we are just um, actually submitted Texas Sprouts Toy 2.0. We got a really great score. We're awaiting council and funding. I actually have a call with NIH right after this webinar, but it's essentially to adapt and expand Texas Sprouts 1.0 into Texas Sprouts 2.0. And I'm working with a lot of colleagues at UT Health, um, uh, Dr. Uh, Vandenberg, uh, Dr. Holscher, uh, Dr. Brown, Dr. Ranjit um, from UT Health, um, Dr. Burgermaster from UT Austin, and Dr. Seguin Fowler from Texas A&M AgriLife. And essentially the difference is, is that we're going to be training extension agents to train the teachers. So we are not gonna be providing the teachers to go in there and do it. We're gonna be training the teachers to be able to do it themselves. Um, uh, kind of a, uh, incorporating all the other things I talked about, we'll provide GLC and administrator training, trainings, uh, plus teacher stipends. We'll be delivering the cook kits through the grocery store. They'll have access to our very robust uh, web-based platform. Uh, we'll have low local master gardeners partnerships where local uh, master gardeners will be placed at each of the school sites to, to aid in um, uh, the education as well as the maintenance of the physical garden. And we're looking at a whole month, um, bunch of different implementation outcomes, including reach, dose, adoption, cost, fidelity, acceptability, feasibility, and maintenance. Uh, it will be a cluster randomized control trial, and we'll also be looking at the effects on child and parent health outcomes as we did before, except we're following it up with the two, a 21 month follow up. Wanted to give you a little bit of uh, background on our Greener Planet. Uh, Greener Planet is a national nonprofit. If you haven't heard of it, I, I would suggest going and look at it. They have awesome stuff online, they're be beautiful material. But in our increasing climate change and the fact that many states are in droughts and we've got shifts in weather, um, a lot of schools are looking to hydroponics as a, um, as a possibility to teach kids where their food comes from and also as a way to increase um, access and availability to produce in schools. Um, a little bit about hydroponics is they saves around 70, 90% more water than soil. So in a drought, this could be a really good option. Uh, and it's enhanced produce yields, so you can grow more. It's suitable for all climates. You just have to grow it inside. It doesn't, it, it, it can have direct exposure in the classrooms. So the current Greener Planet is got a large footprint. They're national, they're also in Canada. And 
they have two different programs. They have the Hydro Connect and the Garden Connect. A Hydro Connect are the, um, are the lessons that go along with the hydroponics units. And the Garden Connect has a really nice um, uh, gardening lessons that can go along with an outdoor garden space. The hydroponics unit, um, what they do is for, and it depends on um, that if the school is Title I or not, but they do offer scholarships. To get these units, it's about $1,500 if you're paying for them. But again, they offer scholarships uh, to certain schools. It comes with a big hydroponic, a large commercial unit. Um, a lot of times these units are put in either a portable or I love it when they're in the cafeteria so that kids can actually see the food growing while they're eating. And then they get small table taught units that are designed to be in the classroom. So again, that connection between the classroom and the cafeteria. They've developed a series of really pretty content. And when I say pretty, I'm a researcher. And so I think that we have really great, I think Texas Sprouts curriculum is fantastic, but it could be probably prettier. <laughs> Um, their background is actually the, the CEO has a background in film. And so they've developed these really gorgeous um, online resources that have videos embedded in them. And they have, um, they have it's K through 12 and they offer 18 different lessons. Uh, and it includes, and again, it's mapped on science, math, and they also teach financial literacy. And their Garden Connect is from pre-K to five, fifth grade. And again, it has 18 lessons that can also be used um, to complement uh, the school garden. So we are working with them. They have just hired us to do um, to be in charge of their evaluation. They just received a large grant from Ingleston Foundation, and we're going to be actually helping them evaluate. We're going to collect. We're going to conduct a quasi experimental design where there will be a control schools that will be the onboarding schools will also um, versus garden connect versus hydro connect versus the combination of garden connect and hydro connect and it will be done in austin and san antonio we're going to evaluate at the child parent teacher and administration level uh, as well as track all of program implementation metrics and again they have this really beautiful kind of web-based platform that makes it really easy to kind of track that we can see how many times Teachers have watched a video, how many lessons they download, downloaded. Um, so there's lots of really, it's a great partnership that we're gonna be doing to kind of expand this. And I just wanna kind of, I know I've thrown a lot out there as far as evidence-based, as far as kind of the sustainability projects. I just wanna point out that childhood obesity and diabetes and cardiometabolic diseases, it's a multiple level problem and it really takes a multiple level solution. So targeting the individual, the family, the school, community. A lot of the work I do doesn't focus on policy, but the work UT Health does. It really is that really that lens of targeting at multiple levels. And we can teach kids all day long what they should be eating, but until we increase the access and availability of healthy foods to children, we're gonna have a real hard time moving the dial to getting them to eat those foods. And so I really changed my kind of lens on what needs to be done. It's a, um, it, it's a multiple level problem that takes a multiple level solution. And being in academia for 20 plus years, I don't wanna age myself, but a lot of times what happens is we write an NIH grant, we conduct an RCT, we publish the results, and then we write the next grant. And that cycle is just kind of ongoing. And so if childhood obesity and nutrition education is our outcome, I feel like many of us that work in academia, we can kind of get stuck in this cycle of, of grant writing and paper writing. Um, and those are important things. And I'm, I, my, any of my um, superiors on this, I know those are important and I plan on still doing those things, but I'm really, I'm really more about how can we engage the community. And so as you saw from here, there's a lot of amazing nonprofits and foundation partners that are already doing amazing work. So how can we as academic partners partner with them? They're already doing really cool projects. How can we help elevate, evaluate it and get those results back so it can, can cause system change in the schools, in the communities, in the cities, in the, in the government? So really focusing on how do we get that community, community engagement how do we target both the individual, family, school, and community level? How do we think about maintenance and sustainability? How can we provide continued evaluation? 
So many of us that work in academia, that's what we were used to doing is evaluation. And so I think it's a really nice partnership if we can partner with foundations that are already doing great programming, help them evaluate their program and then help disseminate those results. Um, and then also a big plug, whereas in academia and higher education, we have access to a ton of undergraduate and graduate students and medical students. And so, you know, we should be thinking outside the box and how we can train that next generation of scientists and teachers to, to then give back to the communities and provide, um, you know, these health programs. Once again, uh, it's a massive amount of funding and partnerships that goes into doing this type of work. And I wanted to give them a big shout out. Um, big shout out to Sprouts Healthy Communities Foundation, um, NIH, UT Health, Big Green, A&M, Whole Kids, School Garden Support Organization Network, Blue Cross Blue Shield, Green Our Planet, um, City of Austin, Austin Independent School District. And want to point you to our website. We have a great website that's got a ton of curated curriculum programs and lessons. We also have the scorecard there. We have videos. We have past webinars. Um, we're going to be expanding on our web platform uh, in the future, but you can certainly check it out there. And have a little time for questions. I probably went over. <laughs> Sorry, Sandra. <laughs> Sandra, we can't hear you. Sorry, I was muted. <laughs> Thank no. you, Jay, for an awesome presentation. And I just want to say, I just really appreciate how you've been able to take one project and then just create this whole, really, I guess this whole lab, you know, focused on this topic. And I think it's just really cool how you've been able to do it and work with um, community organizations. Um, so we do have a couple minutes for questions. So let me just um, start the very first one. So this was um, a question that was related to the Sprout study. Um, question is, how big was your staff that helped you with the study? And then also, did the teachers do the nutrition education or did health educators do the nutrition education? Right. Um, so I had a big team uh, and a lot of them were graduate students. I had about four or five graduate students that were devoted pretty much full time to the study. And then I had Katie, which is the project manager, and about um, four full time educators to help go out to the schools. Um, the educators for Texas Sprouts, the ones that I hired, actually did the teaching. And so the way we initially did it is they did the teaching and the te school teachers were in there learning from them while they were doing the teaching. Um, it didn't always happen that way. Uh, some teachers were really engaged and wanted us, were super excited about it and were like all hands on. Other teachers were, you know, used that time to get caught up on everything else. And so uh, what, what happened after we got done with Texas Sprouts is we realized that we were gonna be working, we were working with the Sustainable Food Center. The Sustainable Food Center led a series of trainings to all the school teachers to help them be able to continue uh, teaching in the garden and using Texas Sprouts curriculum. However, those kind of trainings were pretty poorly attended. And so what we, what we found is that we had a lot of schools that had a lot of interest after we put in these gardens and, and created this awesome program, but they didn't have the training and the skills to be able to do it. And that's where Sprouting Teachers kind of was born. And so that we then provided more of those specialized trainings. So those are the six trainings per year that the school teachers can get. And that program is free. We did open because we had such a big um, uh, need for it. We did open applications for that project, so we cannot provide training to everybody. We have them apply and we assess kind of their readiness, and then we choose schools that have, you know, uh, agree to the six trainings and agree to a little bit more, uh, you know, a bigger responsibility, and then they're the ones that are enrolled in our Sprouting Teachers Program. And we've had schools that have done our Sprouting Teachers Program for three, four years in addition to doing the intern program. So it's kind of like once they're in, it's they're hooked and they want to continue, they want more. 
So a follow-up question to that, Sprouting Teachers, is um, what are the nine states where the Sprouting Teachers program is being offered right now? Gosh, I was afraid. I know. <laughs> I know we're in Texas. We're in Oklahoma, California. I wish Katie was on this call. Um, there was a couple states in Midwest. And, and we can... We can come back to that sometime. Yeah. What we've done in the past, if, if we can't answer all the questions, um, we kind of get them all um, collated and then we send them out on the, put them out on the, on the website. So you have time to go look it up. And it somewhere. wasn't a lot of schools. It was like one or two schools that expressed interest. And so we tried them in our program and we worked out great. I mean, I think the pandemic has taught us one thing is we can do most things virtually. And so that has been super helpful. And to the point where they're showing us, like they're with FaceTiming us and showing us their garden, and then my staff can give them, you know, tips on what are some things that they can do to the physical maintenance of their garden. My staff includes a lot of master gardeners and a lot of uh, people with horticultural uh, expertise, which is great. I'm always constantly asking them my own gardening questions. <laughs> All right. Um, let's see. For those students that received a blood-based test indicating prediabetes, was there any additional follow-up beyond the GARDEN program? Right. So we not only had a couple that were pre-diabetic, we did have some not included in the analysis that came up to be type 1 or type 2. And we worked, uh, Dr. Megan Gray, uh, sorry, Dr. Stephen Pont was on that grant, and we referred, um, uh, any cases were referred to him, and he would follow up with his team. Um, there were a couple cases where uh, the type one was referred to, to Dell. Um, the, the two that were type one referred to Dell for follow up. Uh, we send all adverse results to the parents. And so if they were had elevated BMI, high blood pressure, or an elevated glucose or HbA1c value, we sent those to the parents with a list of clinics and FQHCs that they could follow up with. But it was just the ones that had uh, type 2 or type 1 diagnosis that we followed up with the physician. Okay. Okay, one last question. And there are more questions, so we will follow up on this. But I think this is a good one, to, and this is not an easy one. Um, <laughs> you mentioned you didn't get the parent involvement that you had mm. hoped for. How important is parent engagement and involvement to overall success? Yeah, great question. And I should have included that. We had less than 7% of parents even attend one of our lessons. And so it was really frustrating because we did everything. We provided free childcare, free meals. Um, it, I think that it is a, a reflection of the communities that we were in. Many of these families have one car and somebody would need it for work. And so most of these kids were bused into school. So the location was a huge barrier. We did it at the school. And I think now, especially given that so many people are much more comfortable with virtual visits, the next round will include a lot of virtual lessons. I think there's utility in getting the families up to the school so they can see the school garden, but maybe it could be one or two in-persons and the rest have that virtual option. 100% we would do that. The other way is that if you can provide nutrition education, if you can go to where the families are, that's super helpful because transportation is a huge barrier for sure and we've seen this in other studies as well right where it's just hard to get the parents involved the other thing i want to mention is our school garden this the yield of a school garden isn't huge anyone who works in school gardens you, you're going to get enough probably for some classroom activities maybe some giveaways but um it's not really enough to provide fresh produce to all of the families and so i think you know it really is designed to to more be the platform that teaches them about where their food comes and to get them interested and try to plan it their own. But I'm not naive to think that school gardening is going to cure food, food secure, insecurity and provide access and availability to uh, fruits and vegetables to all families in that school. That, that's just not possible. Now, maybe the combination of adding hydroponics can help increase the yield. Um, but I also think like programs like the Brighter Bites program and other programs that are out there that provide produce to, to families and in large quantities, those are great programs that can really, you know, give that access and availability to help really move the dial with increases in intake and reducing obesity. 
So I think it's it's not the only answer. It's just one part of the equation. Teaching kids where their food comes from is really the way that you can increase preferences and willingness to try those foods to set those long-term behaviors. Well, on that note, I think um, I just want to thank you so much for yeah. an excellent presentation. And um, as I mentioned before, we will have this on our website. Um, and thank you all very much for attending. Um, and we'll see you all for our next webinar. Thank you. Thank you.